Thank you. It's a privilege to introduce our next speaker. As we heard this morning, uh, you know, the, the efforts to privatize are relentless, and privatization has been the, the mantra that we've been hearing from the corporatists for the last 35 years. Many of you have been engaged in the battles to stave off what governments and corporations have told us is the inevitable. In Alberta, the government has made some efforts to privatize education, but they haven't given us the full, the full shot yet. The 10-year vision that uh, Premier Prentice announced the other day starts off with three years of cutbacks. So he's setting the table for privatization. It's the idea of start a public system and then people will be driven towards the, public, the private. It's always encouraging, though, as we heard again this morning and last night, uh, to hear what others are doing in, in their struggle. And we can learn from that, as we also discovered this morning again. So teachers in Chicago have had great success in their struggle. And their leader, Sarah Haynes, has been a key player in that success. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Haynes. Hello. So you heard it. It took a while to get here. It was about a 15-hour ordeal, and I lost my luggage in the process. But very happy to be here. Uh, my, my family's Canadian. My mom's from Vancouver Island. And my Cousin Amber's here, so that's yes, really excited to be up in Canada, where I'd love to come. Um, so um, I'm not a leader in the Teachers Union, just so you know. I'm one of the research, uh, members of the research team, but we are a 70-person operation with membership of almost 30,000 people, because um, city of 3 million, so quite a large operation. So. Without further ado, um, we have been called ground zero of neoliberal education policies. Um, in 1983, the education secretary for the federal government uh, issued a report called A Nation at Risk and called Chicago an absolute failure. Our schools were absolutely failing, and it was a total disaster. Um, in the 80s, we were lucky to have a very progressive um, African-American um, mayor Harold Washington, who, um, and there was a lot of movement to get him into office, so there was a lot of progressivism, and that led to the Chicago School Reform Act of 1988, which um, gave considerable power to communities. Every school would have a local school council made up of parents and community members and teachers. They got to elect their principal and choose their own curriculum. Um, it was really, really powerful. It was a huge, huge movement. Um, there were a lot of demonstrations that went up to it. Unfortunately, though, the status quo got right back in after Harold Washington died of a heart attack, and Mayor Daley, whose father led Chicago for 20 years, Mayor Daley's um, the second mayor daily, he got into office in 89, quickly dismantled everything, of course. He, he ran pretending he was in support of it to get elected. But in 1995, um, the state passed a law called the Amendatory Act, which took almost everything away and gave mayoral control of our schools and um, our school board. So the school board used to be um, appointed after recommendations were made from the public. So the public didn't elect the school board, but they at least got to nominate who it was. Now it was going to be business people nominated by the mayor and our superintendent was replaced by a CEO who was his former finance director. No education background whatsoever. Um, then charter schools were passed in the state of Illinois in 1996. We got our first 11 charters in 1997. We now have 140 something charters and growing um, out of a school district with 670 schools. So they are a significant portion. Um, it's 50,000 kids, which is about 12% of the kids. But they're fighting desperately for more. They want to take over. Um, but we are staving off, as you'll hear. 2001, um, George Bush signed in No Child Left Behind, which is the most ridiculous federal le legislation. He said, all children must be 100% proficient in reading and math by 2014, regardless of special ed needs, regardless of English language learning needs, 
every kid, poor or rich, must do it, or your school will be shut down, your school can be turned over to a private operator, and we will withhold federal funding. Um, our schools get about 20 or 30 percent of their funding from the federal government, um, 30 percent from the state, and the rest is local property taxes, which is what leads to massive inequalities, because the wealthy suburbs, you know, $20,000 per pupil, the poor communities, the rural communities have like $6,000 per pupil to spend, um, so they don't have libraries or computers or anything. In 2004, Chicago launched a program called Renaissance 2010. It was written by the Commercial Club of Chicago, which is a bunch of business in, um, uh, businesses who said, you know, we can't hire these kids, they're all, you know, they can't read. For the, for the sake of Chicago, for the sake of our economy, we need to do this. So they're going to close 100 schools, failing schools, um, and then they were going to reopen 100 new ones, only a third of which were supposed to be private initially. So they wanted magnets and selective enrollments and military schools and specialty schools and other kinds of schools. Um, so President Obama got elected in 2008. He took the guy who wrote Renaissance 2010, Arnie Duncan, our former CEO, he took him to the federal government. So now he runs the nation. So again, Chicago gets to lead the country. We were so lucky. So they wrote what's called Race to the Top, and they decided we, um, we had an anti-poverty law in 1965 um, during Johnson that said poverty affects education. And there's a lot of reasons why rural kids and low-income kids and immigrant kids and all these kids are not doing so well, so let's fund, let's give extra support. Race to the Top said no, we want you to compete for your funding because competition always works for everybody. So states had to apply for the funding and states had to radically change their laws. Our states are like your provinces where even though we have the federal education policy, it's, it's kind of limited. Each, each of our 50 states can kind of do whatever it wants. So there's massive uh, differentiation across the 50 states in terms of how, how education is funded and carried out. So your state had to um, have pro-charter legislation. You had to show that you were going to you know, push to privatization. And you had to severely limit your teacher unions and, and their abilities to um, control their classroom and um, crazy draconian evaluation plans and um, making it much more difficult to get tenure and much more difficult to strike. So, um, and then we didn't get the money. <laughs> so we changed the law to limit, to do all these things, and then we actually didn't even win any of the money, and the money was very little anyway. But one of the things that came out of that was the Performance Evaluation Reform Act, um, which uh, is very, very strict on teachers and evaluation. And then out of that, which is even worse, it's called SB 7, 7 Senate Bill 7, and that came in right after um, my administration took office, and I'll go into details about that, but that was, we were blindsided by it, and it's really done a lot of damage in Chicago that we've had to fight against. So just to give you a little background, um, our city is about 40% uh, white, 40% Latino, 40% African American, I'm not doing my numbers right, and like 10% Asian. Um, so it's, it's, it's fairly mixed, fairly mixed, but very, very segregated. We are the most segregated city in the entire country. Sometimes Milwaukee surpasses us, but it's, it's fairly, fairly segregated economically and racially. So in, even though there's 40% white people in Chicago, there are 9% white kids in the public school system. The rest all go to private schools. And that's been a, a steady decline since um, about the 80s. So um, we have a lot of wealthy people in Chicago. Um, I can't remember what the entire poverty rate is, but 87% of our public school students are low income. 90% um, are what we call hyper-segregated, um, and uh, a researcher from, I believe, New York came up with the term, and that is when your school um, is at, there, 90 to 95% of your school is of one ethnicity. So 90% of our schools are hyper-segregated. So if, if you can just picture what that means. And pretty much you either go to an all-black school you go to a majority white school or an all Latino school. Very few schools are mixed in Chicago. Um, so 88% of the schools that students have been affected by are school actions, which is closing schools, turning them around to private operators. Um, we, um, there's actually a long list. We will jam a charter school inside the building and make them co-share. The charter gets all the bells and whistles and 
we'll do like more capital improvement on that end of the building. It's, it's really <laughs> second class citizens. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the low income and students of color that get affected by all of these policies. Um, and we've lost a tremendous amount of our black teachers. So Chicago is still about 42% of our students are black. Only 29% of our teachers are black. Um, and they have been the um, targeted victim of our school action policies. Um, and mostly it's because they, they teach in struggling communities. So we're shutting down our schools and privatizing our schools in struggling communities, firing all the teachers. And what we're doing is we're bringing in young white people with, through a program called Teach for America, uh, where we get the best and brightest from our top universities. And all these bubbly, blonde girls from Iowa are coming in to teach in the inner city. They only teach for two years and leave. It's a, it's a stepping stone resume building program for those kids. But what is left is our kids in the most struggling school have this like revolving door of young teachers who can't relate to them at all and just have five weeks of training, read a script, and they're in and out. So it's, it's pretty devastating. So, um, so the neoliberalism obviously brings the competition and choice into education. So I told you our superintendent is now a CEO. Um, we have pushed back tremendously on that, so now the last two CEOs actually were superintendents of school districts. That's in relation to us pushing back. So they still have a title of CEO. They were actually classroom teachers, principals, and superintendents, so that's a big victory. We have what's called a portfolio district, so they, they want choice. They say parents want choice, but parents don't want choice. They want good neighborhood schools. But portfolio district means we have to have you know, like an investment portfolio. So you want to show that we have all these different types of schools. And what we have is just this chaotic mess. And no one knows how to apply to schools. No one knows what the schools mean. They have bizarre names. And it's, it's actually just a bunch of chaos. And again, people just actually want neighborhood schools. Um, we have franchising schools. So our charters, in Illinois, the charter law, every state has its own charter law. Illinois' charter law says um, you can only have so many charters in the whole state, rural, you know, the whole entire state of Illinois. Um, but, so a school like Noble Street, the Noble Street, what is now a network, they get a charter, they get approved for a charter, and then they franchise. And that's considered one charter school, even though now it's 15 schools taking over our high schools. So that was a nice little loophole for them. So they're franchising our schools, um, and they all have these cookie cutter little models that they do. And remember, we used to have this big you know, reform with local school councils where parents and communities were writing their curriculum. Everything was based on the neighborhood. It was culturally appropriate. You know, it was really driven by that community and the 500 kids that go to that school. Now we've got these cookie cutter models. And you know, it's the antithesis of what, our new, you know, what we really wanted. Um, so we're opening and closing schools as if they were stores in a mall. So it's, I mean, it's, it's absolute chaos. The charters aren't closing fast enough, but they are closing. And the teachers union is actually, even though we're opposed to charters, we're opposed to closing schools because it's so devastating for a community, for the teachers, for the kids. And just opening and closing a school, like, oh, I didn't make enough profit, so I'm going to close. I mean, you don't, in three years, you don't just open and close, open and close. That's what they're doing with our schools. And they're creating a lot of chaos. The kids have to keep moving to different schools. Mo mobility greatly affects um, educational outcomes. Um, and some of our kids are moving several times, not only because they have housing issues, but now because of their schools. Um, so we are, I'm sure you guys are up with this too, obsessed with data. Everything is data. The kids, I mean, Bill Gates was trying to do this really terrifying program where like, our, our kids' day would be like within data. Like everything was going to be traceable, trackable, measurable. You know, obsessed with all this data, and you know, in the end, the teachers union keeps saying, "We know what works. We know how to teach. Our we've got students that are going off to Harvard. We're, we know how to do it right, and it has nothing to do with data." Um, we have this mass explosion of these edu venture firms and profits, especially in Chicago. We um, our mayor wants to be the new tech hub, so we have Yelp and Google and Motorola, all these you know uh, tech firms that they're luring in with tax subsidies. And now we have all these education startup companies, and everyone's doing online education and online curriculum and data tracking, and it's just millions and millions of little companies are exploding um, to, to profit off of our public education. Um, so it's the next big profit-making investment. And there's a lot, if you go through the business um, news, 
and just Googling, it's like, you know, there was the, the tech boom and bust, the housing boom, I don't know if you guys had that, we had it very bad and bust, and education. It literally is, we've got all these vultures all over Wall Street yes. saying this is the next big um, profit making investment and they're buying up these firms and selling them and conglomerating them like Pearson who's like taking over the entire world. Yes. Um, so and then we're outsourcing like crazy so you know we don't have any money we don't have any money which I'll show you later is always BS um, and we're out so they want to pretend that they're being cognizant of the money so they keep slashing central office but all they're doing is outsourcing they're outsourcing their actual administration um, and it's creating all kinds of chaos and not saving us any money at all, which is what the union is constantly trying to prove. So how did we get here? This, it, I mean, it actually started before the 1983 report. Um, it was Sputnik. I don't know if Canada was affected as badly by Sputnik as we were, but basically the Russians beat us to the moon or beat us into outer space, and America became absolutely obsessed with science and math and, you know, our international competitiveness this, we have to rule the world, um, and so our students are failing. And um, but it's not true because if you know, I'm not a big test score fan. But if you do want to look at PISA, and you do want to look at international scores. If you hold for socioeconomics, we're still up there. Our kids are very smart. The ones that have had breakfast, the ones that have healthcare, the ones that you know don't live in a rat infested. <laughs> So we're always trying to fight back with that because the people that are fighting against us just hold it because we, we're in the dead middle if you take in all our poor, if you take every single American kid, we are dead middle, uh, which isn't bad. I mean, we're dead middle of the top OECD countries, you know, which is still better than most of the world. But um, anyway, so, right, so chicken little, the sky is falling. <laughs> um, so this is very hard to see. I'm very sorry about that. Um, this is a map that just shows you totally can't see, but this is Chicago, and the, um, the blue squares are closed schools, so we have lost 135 schools since the year 2000, and the green dots are the charters, and I did this in 2013 when we had our massive 50 school closures, um, and so it was only up until 2013 when we had 122 charters, but they're the exact same neighborhoods, and so this is one of the things we're using to debunk the myth about choice. The district is doing this to us. The parents are not asking for this. So the charters come in with all their slick marketing. They're funded by the Gates Foundation and the Walton Foundation, you know, from Walmart. And they've got all this slick marketing. And so they're trying to, um, you know, lure in the parents. So there's that. But then when the kids do come into the shiny brand new building, which looks much better than the dilapidated crappy one with 20-year-old textbooks down the street, um, you know, the neighborhood schools are losing their kids. So as the neighborhood schools lose their kids, they lose their funding, and then they do eventually shut down, and it becomes a you know, never-ending cycle. So the charter schools is the reason why the schools are closing. Um, they, they say the contrary. But, and it's only happening in our poor black and Latino communities, which can't be anything but a conspiracy. I mean, if charters were so great, the middle-class white people would want them to, and no one wants them, and they're not in their neighborhoods. So um, so this is a short list of all the people who are attacking us right now that we are constantly fighting against. Um, they are extremely well funded, very well connected. Um, some, some of these are national groups, some of them are local. Um, they, none of them, I don't think, have kids in the public education system. <laughs> I, mean, I highly, highly doubt that. If they did, they're in the best selective enrollment schools. Um, so I'm going to focus here on Stanford children just as a case study example of how we are getting attacked and how we're fighting back against it. These people, as you'll see in the next one, they're all connected to each other. Oh, okay. they're all connected to each other. So this was me trying to just figure out a power diagram. Um, I'm sure this could be a thousand times more extensive and detailed. They're all being funded by the same people. They're all connected to the same politicians. So there's a thousand of these little you know, pro-education fund groups, but they're all the same thing. And they're all over the country, and they're really scary. They have great PR firms. Um, like I said, they're very connected, and um, it's very difficult to fight against um, all of this. So with Stand for Children, it started in Oregon 
the son of a civil rights leader started it. It started off with a great idea. Let's get more funding for our kids in Oregon. Yeah, everyone jumped on board. It sounded wonderful. And it quickly became corporatized, where uh, Miriam Wright um, Edelman, the, uh, the mom of the, the guy who started it, I mean, she even took her name away because it had nothing to do with civil rights anymore. So anyway, they, they show up in Illinois out of nowhere. We had just taken office, um, which I'll get a little bit into the rise of my union, but um, we had just taken office, you know, deer in the headlights, you know, where you have to run this massive administration. It was a bunch of rank and file teachers that don't know how to make ph photocopies and, you know, or anything. Anyway, we just took office and all of a sudden these people come in out of nowhere and we had um, a state election coming up and all of a sudden they're paying all this money and we have, I, I don't know if you have them here, they're called PACs, Political Action Committee. So you, you create this like nonprofit or whatever political group and you can funnel the money to politicians that way. So all of a sudden the newspapers are like, who is this stand group that's giving tens of thousands of dollars to all these people? And so um, they gave it to the lead of the Senate who created this Education Reform Committee and um, they got a bunch of people elected and they started talking about how the schools are failing and we got to fix them. So they drafted a bill called SB7, Senate Bill 7, and um, this was out of nowhere. These are people not even from our state writing this. This law was aimed just to kill the teachers union. This, this is all it was. So they, they wrote it, you know, to, oh, it's for the kids and blah, blah, blah. Um, they wanted to eliminate our right to strike. They wanted to eliminate tenure. They wanted to make teacher evaluation ten times harder than that previous bill I already mentioned already was, which was already one of the highest in the nation. Um, I mean, they want to put teachers in a magnifying glass and make it absolutely impossible to teach and not trust at all that people actually have degrees and 5, 10, 20 years of teaching experience and do know what they're talking about. And again, it's the poverty. I mean, our kids in Chicago that go to schools that are well-resourced, that come from higher socioeconomic backgrounds, are all doing great. It's the low-income kids, and we have extreme poverty in Chicago. So... Um, they blindsided us, it got passed, we weren't ready, we didn't have a political army, we didn't know how to fight in the Capitol, you know, we didn't have those connections yet. Uh, we did pull back a ton, I mean, as much as we got blindsided, we did pull back a ton. And our state federation, so we're a local, our state federation is not progressive, and they didn't help much. They were, like um, we were talking about earlier this morning, I mean, they compromised too much with management, and they compromised too much with the politicians. So that's what we were also up against, so that's like our you know, we have three levels. We have the local, the state, and then the national AFT. Um, you know, we had to work within that kind of context, too, which was out of our control. Um, one of the things that ended up bringing the downfall um, later has helped a lot of our fight against some of these corporate um, jerks that are trying to destroy us. Um, at the Aspen Institute, which is a very, unlike the foundation here, it's a very, very right-wing, private, gathering in Aspen, Colorado every year, business people and elites. So they, John, um, Joe, um, Josh Edelman, who um, started um, Stanford Children and did the SB7 bill, was giving a talk and he was, he didn't know he was being filmed and he was saying how he came in and blindsided us and ha ha ha, and he did this to them and this is how you can go and destroy your teachers unions in other states. And he was like trying to tell all these politicians and but he was filmed and it went viral. And so everyone, yeah, so he quickly apologized or whatever, but they're a lot quieter now. You, unfortunately, they're probably working behind the scenes because they've been completely exposed. So, um, but then in, um, um, oh, they started trying to become active in the school action fight, so then they could look like they were on our side and they were for public schools, so they hired some community organizers that were skilled at community organizing, knew how to talk, knew how to, whatever, but still they're, they're still outsiders, right? And it wasn't until 2012, two years after they opened, that they finally launched their parent recruitment effort, even though Stand for Children and their mission statement is that it's a parent grassroots organization. So two years after they come to you know, Chicago, spend tons of money on statewide campaigns, um, all of a sudden now they're their parent group. And um, I, I don't even hear much of them anymore, so I'm not even sure what they're doing, but they're totally a farce. So how did we get elected? Um, as I said, we had this progressive mayor, Harold Washington. Um, the 80s, every, you know, things were, there was, there was some scary stuff happening in Chicago in general because of neoliberalism and everything, but we had active, our union was active, we had a huge strike, we had this big parent-led reform act, which was just awesome, there was all this rainbow coalition stuff going on, you know, everything was happy, 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 
Richard Daly gets elected, um, everything starts, you know, going to hell in the 90s, um, very, very fast uh, with the charters. So our, our unions weren't doing anything. So the union was very active in 87, and then the leader died, and her successor didn't do anything. So in the 90s, there were no demos. There were no rallies, and it just got very complacent and started working with management, didn't fight the charters or anything. There was a brief moment in 2001, 2004 where progressive group got in, but they didn't know what they were doing at all. They quickly got kicked out of office. They had a really bad contract. And then that previous union that had been in office forever, they came back in, and they were just total business unionism, just, you know, work with management. They would do little press conferences every, you know, oh, we're kind of against this privatization, but they didn't mobilize anyone. So our teachers were mad. So in 2008, they started organizing among themselves to fight back, which led to getting elected in 2010 very, very narrowly with a runoff election. Um, and then unfortunately in 2011, we got our current mayor, which is another part of the big, big fight. Um, but then, oh, and something got cut off. In 2013, we got reelected, and by then it was a landslide. So now we're a popular uh, you know, caucus in the union. So the fight begins. Um, one of the first leaders, our vice president, um, they were this district was trying to put a naval academy inside his high school. So his high school would still stay on this side of the building, and the naval academy would come on the other. And this is the beginning of the militarization of Chicago. I mean, yeah, of Chicago schools. We now have the most military schools in the total in the country, um, in our high schools. And um, so he was fighting against that. They lost, but they, they met a lot of really cool people, a lot of cool parents in that fight. Then there was this Renaissance 2010 program that I mentioned that the commercial club started. So other teachers were starting to fight against that. They were reading about it. They're like, wait a minute, this is, they're selling off our schools. They're privatizing. We've got to fight. They're starting to talk to each other. Um, and char they're fighting charter expansions, and they're fighting against school closures because we, like I said, ended up losing um, over 100 schools. Um, so they're fighting with teachers and, I mean, um, with parents and community groups, and, and these were popular issues. So this was the beginning of the caucus, who didn't even think it was gonna run for office. This was just, we gotta do something because our union's not doing anything. So this is just the rank and file doing it on their own. So um, in, the, in the first decade of the, um, of the 2000s, we lost 70 schools and 6,000 um, union jobs, and that includes janitors, lunch staff, security guards, clerks. There's five unions, operating engineers, there's five unions that work in our schools. Um, but what, and educate, Red 10 is an educational apartheid, and that's what I showed you on the map, that it's closing the schools and opening the charters is only happening in black and Latino communities, um, and fighting against uh, the racism is what made CORE popular. The parents understood it, the community groups understood it, that was the first time people were putting that kind of name on what was happening. Because um, we, weren't, we weren't closing failing schools, we were closing certain schools in certain communities with certain kids. Um, so um, I'm not going to go too much into this, but so we used to be service model union, and uh, we did do grievances and arbitrations, I mean it's not like the union wasn't working at all, um, and they always wanted to get more salary for their members, that was their big, that's what they thought the big thing was to do, but they also had huge bloated salaries, huge. Um, but we are a social organizing union and social movement union, and we're, it's the opposite. We just, we believe in just mobilization, activism, rank and file, collective action. Um, and so, and we use the contract campaign to um, organize the rank and file. So how we phrase what we are fighting for, how we articulate it, um, how we talk to parents and community, it's, it's the contract, so it's the union protection, but it's for a social justice purpose, which um, is, is the opposite of what it used to be. Um, we originally were a very active union. We are the first teachers union in the country. Um, we were very active. There were, when this um, demonstration took place downtown in 1933, uh, the teachers hadn't been paid at all. They were getting script or whatever, like paper notes that, like, didn't, I don't even think they could cash them in at a store. It was literally nothing. Um, and um, this was the beginning of our union. It was started in 1937. Uh, but it ebbed and flowed. I mean, we would get people in office that got complacent and 
lazy and selfish. Um, there was a lot of racism in the 60s, so there was a progressive caucus that was fighting for equality for, for the teachers and the students. Um, definitely ebbed and flowed. This is the, probably the most radical since the 30s, this current administration. So early organizing, this is again before we took office. Um, Jackson Potter, who kind of started our caucus, went to the Trinational, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's a Canada, uh, US, Mexican uh, conference, I think coming out of NAFTA. Um, so the BC Teacher Federation came, Ginny uh, Sims, and he was really impressed with the work that they had done um, in their illegal strike um, in mobilizing communities and parents. So they invited her back to come and explain how it worked, how did they do that. Um, they started working with community-based organizations, that's CBOs, which was radical for uh, teacher for teacher groups to do. So they were working with groups that were fighting against whatever was happening in their community. You know, they're all different issue-based um, uh, organizations. They were fighting against the school closures. They started a lot of study groups. They were reading Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine. Um, they were reading um, David Berliner's um, The Myth of Public, what is it, um, Crisis, Crisis in Education, or say, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Manufacturing. Yeah, Manufacturing Crisis, thank you. Yeah, and, um, and then they ran for delegate positions at their schools, so they started small. So by having delegates at your school, you get to go to the House of Delegates meeting, and that's what the union controls. But once they had enough people in the House of Delegates, they could start confronting the union um, from the floor. And they also ran for the pension board. That was their practice run. They got two people ousted. No one had ever challenged anybody on the pension board. They ousted two people and put two of our people in, and that was when they started realizing we could maybe do this. Because um, as you can imagine, in Chicago, 600 schools, uh, if you don't include the charters, I mean, in an enormous city, north, south, east, and west, and to reach schools and all these teachers, um, when you don't have an apparatus, and you don't have any money, is very difficult. So this was extremely uh, grassroots operation. Um, so when we get in, um, we slashed salaries of the staff. So executive board, you know, top level officials were all making 175000 or so, and now they're making 85. Um, and what we did, <laughs> and then even the, the business reps, the business agents, the ones that filed the grievances, they were all making like 150,000. Now you come in at your teacher salary. And our average teacher salary is 72,000 if you have a lot of experience and a lot of education. But if you came in at 60 and we hired you to be union rep, you're making that, you know, and then you get to still keep moving up through the union, you know, um, salary ladder. But well, we used the money we saved for our organizing and research departments. So usually, at least in the states, um, the national unions have organizing and research departments. The locals do not. Uh, we did have, you know, we have money. We have 30,000 members paying dues. Um, but we hired, we hired um, a pretty big organizing and research department. Um, and we identified school leaders um, very concertedly. We have charts all over the walls, we were always trying to find out. We had a bunch of schools we took office that did not have any delegates, which meant no one was fighting the principal, no one was filing grievances, no one was protecting those teachers. They were all by themselves, sometimes physically isolated, um, and so we made sure almost every school, not every school, almost every school has delegates. We have rallies, maybe a little too much, all the time, like almost weekly. I mean, sometimes we're just joining somebody else's, like the U, um, UAW is on strike right now. Uh, they work at the um, um, at some huge mill um, in uh, in uh, Indiana. You know they're downtown, so you know we sent five people. We're running over there, but we're we're in the street all the time, um, fighting. Our delegates, our House of Delegate meetings have become activist oriented. It used to be the officers just standing up there and talking and talking and talking. Everyone's falling asleep, and there's no reason to show up because nothing's being shared. Now it's um, you know a lot of information, and there's always a call to action at every at every meeting. Um, our articles for our newsletters, all research based, action oriented. We are educating our members as much as we possibly can through our magazine or newsletter. Um, every time the school district CPS has a meeting, we pack it. So they're having a budget meeting. They're having a meeting about school closures. So whatever it is, we've got teachers, parents, retired people, staff. And we're at the podium, you know, and we're talking. So we're the media sees us all the time, um, and we're constantly training um, our members. We have, you'll see in a minute, a ton of committees. We have this huge organizing institute. 
Uh, we do communications training so people can talk to the media. And we have a giant bargaining team. It used to happen behind closed doors and it was handed back to the members. Now it's a massive operation. It starts a, way, a year before the contract even expires. Um, so, um, so between those two laws that I mentioned earlier, 1995 Mandatory Act and SB 7, we have lost many of our bargaining rights. So we're out in the street because we, we have lost, we, we only get to bargain over wages, benefits, and not much else. I can't remember what the other one is. It's, it's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Nothing else is negotiable. Class size, nothing else is negotiable anymore. So, um, so we went on strike and they said, they said we couldn't. So the SB7, the guy from the Aspen Institute, they, um, they made in the law on purpose a threshold of 75% vote must be attained before the teachers are going to be allowed to go on strike. And he was laughing at us in Aspen, saying they will never do it. We got a hold, I don't know how they did this. They claim they got a hold of our previous, um, all our strike votes in the 80s, which was a totally different time, totally different union, um, and there was no law against it. They said, you know, we, you know, 50% or however many had ever voted for the strike, they'll never make it. So um, we did a we did a practice run, and then we did a mass mobilization. Um, they left a loophole too, where they didn't say when our strike vote had to happen. So we chose to do it on June 4th, the week before school got out, uh, which really made them mad. They tried taking us to court over that, but the law never said when the strike vote has to happen. So 89% um, I think voted for the strike. So, and that was with 90% participation. Wow. So it was, it was really, really huge. Um, so we hit the streets. It was so exciting. We had tons of rallies leading up to it, too, just to get people like pumped up. Um, literally, anywhere you went in Chicago, people were wearing red. It was just so wonderful. You ride your bike, take the bus, wherever you go. People are honking. North, South, I mean, especially the main thoroughfares where you could hit like six schools in three miles or something. Um, the police, I mean, everybody was on our side. The public transportation workers, you know, everyone was looking to us as like, oh my God, you went up against the mayor. You did this, you know, this is, this is big. Um, and the media too, by the end of the week of the, uh, the first week of the strike, the media was on our side because what we did, we weren't allowed to strike over working conditions um, or learning conditions for our students, but that's all the parents and teachers talked about on the strike line when the media came to visit. So everyone was talking about the fact that we didn't have any air conditioning and the rooms on the third floor are 105 degrees in June and you can't learn in those conditions. There's textbooks that were 20 years old. You know, the computer labs don't work and they're only being used for standardized testing. You know, um, the, the, the buildings were crumbling. We had schools with like, you know, rain buckets in the classroom. Kids have to wear coats in the winter because the windows are so drafty. Um, what else? Class size. We have class size because we don't have a real strong law in Illinois. There are some, there are elementary schools, um, like K through 2, that have 40 children in their room and no teacher aid. And, I mean, so these were the things that the media heard when they joined the, why are you on strike? No one said it was about their salary. Not one single teacher said, you know, I, I, I disagree with the 3% raise. You know, so it wasn't the greedy teacher mantra that people are used to always hearing. So it was, it was awesome. By Friday, they were all on our side. All the op-ed pages, everything was on our side. By Monday, when we voted to continue it, they were getting a little pissed. <laughs> we actually um, went all the way until the next Tuesday. Um, but it was, it was a very, very popular vote. And so what we won, a lot, uh, there was so many restrictions because of the law. But we avoided merit pay. I don't know if you know what merit pay is. But you're, get your test scores up, and we'll give you a raise. Which what that leads to is teaching to the test, which leads to cheating. And there's scandals, and Atlanta is the most famous, where, I mean, these teachers are so paranoid, they're going to lose their job, or they want the raise, and so they teach the test, or they erase the actual answers, or whatever. I mean, merit pay does not work for anyone, and it's not a motivation. Teachers don't teach, because, excuse me, they want an extra thousand um, dollars. Value added um, got reduced to 5% of our evaluation. So value added is another way with the merit pay where they do this bizarro, it, it's been completely disputed, where they try to use these metrics to say, last year your kids were at this percent and now they're here and that's because of you. Um, which maybe in, if in, in your math or English class where you're the only teacher, maybe, which is not true because the kid could have been sleeping that day, the kid could have been sick that day. There's a thousand reasons why a kid does better or worse on a crappy standardized test. 
But the worst part is this van was being affected, was going to get put on every single teacher in the building. The gym teachers were going to get van. The art teachers were going to get van, which is based on English and math, which means what they're like. And then, so we pushed back saying, you can't do this. They don't teach those courses. And they said, yeah, but they contribute to the academic well-being of the kid. So then the overall school VAM will get applied to that teacher. And the teacher will be evaluated. So no one's going to want to work in a low-income school anymore. No one's going to want to work in a school where the, the parents aren't home. The grandparents are raising the kids. It's chaos. They, they have to move a lot. I mean, you know, so anyway, we got it reduced to 5%, which is the best we could do, at least for the moment. We're still fighting it. We got layoff rights because um, we have all these school closures that um, they have to rehire from the pool of laid off teachers first. Um, and that, that was really, really big. We got a diversity committee uh, because we're losing our black teachers um, so badly. Um, so we got a diversity committee is of course moving like molasses, but at least the board has to work with us regularly um, and talk about how to recruit more African American teachers. Uh, we did get raises, we did get some health benefits. Um, Special ed teachers are allowed to file grievances now that they weren't able to file before, um, where you know their work is being completely um, thwarted by paperwork and administration. Uh, books on day one, <laughs> that was a huge victory, because we had schools where they, the principal just whatever, out of ineptness or whatever, didn't bring in the books, so how are teachers supposed to teach? Books have to be in place on day one. Uh, principal bullying is grievable, and this is one that unions across the country yeah, they, they are really looking at us for that. I mean, that was pretty revolutionary, and that's one of our big, um, that's one of the big grievances we file constantly. And they wanted to remove class size limits and say, because of budgetary, we're just going to remove it. And we knew that could be 45, 50 kids in a classroom. So we at least got them to, re to we stopped them from removing the class size limits. So class size limits are in our contract. They are only advisory and but they still exist, and we can at least fight them on that. So we keep moving. Um, so the strike was exciting. We got a lot, a lot of people on our side, parents, community groups. Everybody really loves us and knows us. I mean, people were on the strike line um, the entire time. So we did a three-day march um, against school closings. Fifty schools were shut down in one board meeting in March or in May of 2013. And we did three marches where we did south side, west side, and then the north side, where we went to the schools and we all converged downtown. And that was really powerful. A lot of politicians came with us and the news was all over it. And it allowed you to see the communities. I mean, we walked through these communities because when they closed the schools, these kids were going to have to go now two miles. And there was foreclosed homes. You had to go under scary viaducts. There was, you know, I mean, these, these are our most disinvested communities. And we're now taking away their neighborhood school on top of it. Um, unfortunately, we didn't win, but we did um, uh, we did um, raise the, the level of discourse on it for sure. So fighting, um, growing the membership, growing the movement, and educating is that's our playbook. That's what we're constantly all three of them fighting, educating, and growing. So we have a summer organizing institute, which is pretty radical for a teachers union. They read things like letter from Birmingham jail, union in the community. They go door knocking. Whatever issues we're working on, which is different every year. So we might be fighting for a $15 minimum wage. We might be fighting for an elected school board. Whatever is happening, whatever our community partners want us to do. Our teachers are door knocking. Um, they're testifying in budget hearings. Um, we were able to save this um, great vocational education program. Last year we just swarmed all the meetings. Um, we've done a union solidarity, voter registration drive. And so the people come in and then they do this and then we meet people that we would never have known of before. So we have teachers that are now moving up through the ranks and even running for office that have come through our leadership institute that we would maybe not have identified because they're at a small elementary school on the south side or, or whatever. So, oops. So we have, oh, this got messed up. We have a ton of committees. We have like 25 committees. So that Every aspect of teaching and everything people are interested in gets covered in a committee, a special interest committee. They write policies, they fight with the Board of Education, um, and then so, because there's a lot to talk about, but you know, if, you, if you're talking just within your committee, you can get a lot more work done, and that's been really good for leadership development. Um, it's a lot of work for us staff, but it's really good for leadership development. Um, this is just a, a small example of the communities we work with. We created an organization called the Grassroots Education Movement, which is the symbols on the left. Um, and these are really powerful neighborhood groups that can really mobilize people. And they all have their own 
neighborhood issues like affordable housing and health care and senior care and things like that. And then we also actually have a community board that acts not like our executive board, uh, but parallel to it. And we're accountable to them and they help guide um, you know, the direction of the union. So, and we're in part of broader coalitions, Take Back Chicago, which is a bunch of um, unions and, and, or, and other organizing groups, and then the Grassroots Collaborative, and we use our money to fund these groups, too. So we give them the space to meet sometimes, we help with the research, we help fund, you know, so they're independent of us, but we definitely, they exist in a large part because of us. Parent solidarity, uh, most of these groups didn't even exist before CORE, so this is a lot to do with us. These are radical parents. Like, Raise Your Hand wasn't even radical. They just wanted to fight for more funding in Illinois. Now, these pretty wealthy women who were using their free time as stay-at-home moms to lobby for more money are talking about race in class and are very politically radical. Um, more than a score is fighting against standardized testing. Um, so we've got a lot of parents here across the city. Um, we've got, this is some of the stuff we do in our research department, um, debunking the myth of standardized education, I mean, standardized testing. Um, two things I wanted to call your attention to, the school Chicago students deserve, the black one in the middle, and then the one on the bottom, Just Chicago, those are our platforms, which are very similar to the work that you guys do. So um, the schools, um, our students deserve smaller class size, well-rounded curriculum, appropriate support services, social justice. We backed it up with research. We want this, this is what the research shows. You know, we have, you know, council ratios should be 1 to 250 kids. We've got like 560 to 1 in our schools. I mean, so, and this was very, very powerful. We used, we issued this right before our strike. And it was, this was what led our contract campaign. And this is what made people really support us. Because everybody agreed. If they were opposed to the strike on political reasons, on ideological reasons, or teachers shouldn't do this, or you should have compromised with management, the book helped open a lot of people's eyes to say, you know, no, these teachers are fighting for us. And now we took it up a notch because we just had a municipal election, and this, so this is just like uh, what Pia did. Adjust Chicago is like, we want affordable housing, we want health care, we want um, trauma services, and so this is our citywide platform that expanded upon our um, school platform. So this is more details of just, it overlaps what your teacher federation and what Pia has done um, a lot. And, um, oh, the, sorry, I lost, we're using a different program here, so the slides didn't translate properly. But we, we're doing really good communication. So this was how to lie with math. What it is, is a, it's a graph that shows for every year that they cry deficit. Oh, we're so broke. Oh, you know, we're going to have to lay off teachers. So there, there's the, the press release where they say, oh, we're $2 billion deficit or whatever they make up. Then the budget gets released, usually over the summer, and then it's like, it's a $1.8 million, whatever. The number's drastically reduced. Then the audit comes out a year later, or is it no, six months later? And there was a surplus. So, so we put it in a chart, and it was like so clear. I mean, you don't even have to know how to read a graph to know that this was blatantly lying. They do it every year. We did it from 2005 to 2011. Uh, these are the kinds of things we do for our communications. So our communications office and our organizing office and our research, we're all collaborating together to come up with like um, these kinds of talking points that are really effective. So we've been, um, I'm going to hurry up so I'm talking too long, we've been really involved in politics. I mean unions have always been involved in politics um, and it's exactly like in Norway. We got complacent. We give money to the Democrats. They do jack for us, and we just keep going. But now, now we're being, we're we're writing legislation. We're running our own people. Um, we actually just started the United Workers Fam Working Families Party, and um, you know we've only been in office five years, and people in the Capitol are are becoming scared of us, and they've got billions and. You know, So we just had a horrible, horrible election on Tuesday. I was very, I mean, I almost left Chicago. So this, this horrible mayor got uh, reelected, but he was in a runoff, first in Chicago history. He did not win in the February election. That's the first time in Chicago history, so that's massive. Um, my president, Karen Lewis, I don't know if you know, um, has, brain, has a brain tumor. She was supposed to run for office. The whole city, even the establishment, wanted her to run. Um, she had to um, stop running, but she put uh, Chewy Garcia in place, and he's a longtime activist. He went back to the Harold Washington administration. 
Unfortunately, a lot of people didn't know who he was. Um, he's active in the Latino community. There's still a black Latino um, um, kind of like not co being a good coalition going on. Rom came from the Obama administration. So whatever, he got to sell that, like as if he was somehow connected. I mean, he got fired from his job. I don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we ran five members, teachers. Five teachers ran for office. First time that ever happened. One got elected. Um, the other ones were very, very close. Um, we are driving the political discussion. So, um, you know, we didn't totally win, but we definitely didn't totally lose either. Um, and I'm really going to run through this. So we're fighting charters as much as we can. We are supporting the charter union, which is a great way to fight charters because the whole point of charters is to destroy the teachers' union. If they get to be in their own union, debunks, you know, the whole purpose. So we're, we're working really hard to help them with their union organizing drive. Um, we've, been, we've exposed a bunch of scandals. UNO is a huge charter that we helped. Uh, investigative journalists do this massive scandal exposure, all these people lost their job at the top, these CEOs lost their jobs. Um, we did fight to make sure that no charters go in any of those closed school buildings, um, so that's actually written into policy. Um, they didn't even open any charters last year, that was the first time in 15 years, that one single charter was open, so that was really good. Um, we passed a bunch of laws in the last couple of years, so charters are exempt from all of the the rules because we're supposed to be innovative and blah blah blah, and we're supposed to benefit from the innovation, which we don't. So we passed a whole bunch of laws, totally inhibiting their ability to pick and choose their students, to um, use as much money as they want, to do um, nefarious marketing. We we passed laws that are really crippling um, a lot of the innovative things that they're supposedly doing. Um, and we've, we've been doing a lot of good work in convincing legislators that charters aren't good. I mean, it's, it's been slow coming, um, a lot of meetings, a lot of research, but it is, it's building. Uh, we're fighting against testing, and an unprecedented number of parents are now opting out. We've got schools opting out. We've got, and then people across the country, too. So we've got students walking out. Seattle has been opting out. We have a bill in the um, legislature to allow us to officially opt out by any parent just by signing a form. Um, so that's, that's going to be massive. We're fighting outsourcing as much as we can. So we did a tremendous amount of work and research fighting the Aramark contract for our custodians. Uh, and that's going to be ongoing because it's still bad. But we used all the skills and knowledge we gained from that to fight. And I think we might, we're in the middle of it, but we're fighting against the privatization of our nurses and clinicians. They want to eliminate the office and replace it with a call center. And I'm sorry, if your kid's having anaphylactic shock, and you're calling a call center, you know, what do you think is going to happen by the time the ambulance shows up? Um, so we're fighting them. Clinicians are like the speech pathologists, but um, um, I, think, I think we laid the groundwork to potentially uh, prevent that. So we're constantly fighting against corporations. Um, I don't have to go into too much detail, but we expose who's profiting, who's actually connected. Um, when there's a parent front group that's funded by the Gates Foundation, we're doing um, as many reports as we can to get the corporations out of our education. Um, so we're extremely busy. <laughs> we got school level. We're trying to activate our teachers. We want them fighting grievances. We want them fighting their principal. We want them fighting for what they deserve. Uh, we're in the community fighting for affordable housing and everything the communities want. And then, like I said, everything that we're doing at the state level. Um, the activism is spreading. There's probably even way more than this, but these are radical caucuses like ours that are, are growing across the country now. And um, this is the best. So the CEO that came in, the first one that was a teacher that, you know, was to appease us, um, after he um, got fired, uh, which was already after the strike, he got fired right after the strike, which was very sad for him, but um, <laughs> he said, he told this to um, National News, uh, we severely underestimated the ability of the Chicago Teachers Union to lead a massive grassroots campaign against our administration. So that, that yeah. felt good. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the future um, And then, um, so this is a little too detailed, but um, basically, you know, Gar Chu Garcia, our guy for mayor, didn't lost, but the movement was born. So, you know, Karen, everyone thought the movement was only about Karen, our president. You know, she was able to get Garcia to run. He got 44% of the vote, but the movement is growing. And so, I mean, that's something we need to take away from Tuesday's election. And this is a teacher who narrowly missed getting elected against one of the most machine entrenched aldermen that we've had for 30 years on the West Side, who's a horrible woman. Um, so it's more than a moment, it's a movement, and we are growing stronger every day. And it's really, 
you know, I mean, the, the energy is really high. Like I said, I wanted to leave Chicago on Tuesday, but then I read stuff like this and I forget that, you know, we're still fighting, so. So with that, um, any questions? <laughs> sense of the kind of vigor with which uh, your uh, teachers union is, uh, is working for the benefit of students and ultimately, of course, uh, for the community.